Great. Great, so thanks everybody for joining us for the Citizen Sea Trial meet and greet. Um, before we get started, I thought I would just give a quick um, land acknowledgement. So um, we're on all across BC right now. So we're on a whole bunch of different ancestral and unsettled territories um, of the indigenous peoples. So I'd, uh, if you don't already know whose land you're on, I think we'll just share the um, native dash land um, link uh, just so everybody can look it up. And uh, I'd like to just do a quick seed acknowledgement too, because so many of the seeds that end up in our hands have had to go through so many seed breeders. Our tomatoes were, you know, originally uh, from Central America and the number of people that have had to save these seeds for them to finally end up in our hands is really quite incredible. So I'd love to just think about that and feel like these things are always a good call to action. So I think um, for today, uh, yeah, if you don't know whose land you're on, I would definitely recommend using uh, the native land um, link to search that up. And I'd also encourage everybody to maybe look up uh, the chief in their local area. Um, I live in New Westminster and we have a great chief, Rhonda Larrabee. She speaks at many events and it's kind of nice to know who's, um, who's the chief of your indigenous land. So with that, I'll move on. So yeah, the Citizen Sea Trial has been going on since 2016. And I think some of the benefits of being in the program is you get to engage with the plant breeders and have the chance at trying your own seeds. While saving your own seeds isn't the main focus of the Citizen Sea Trial, it's mostly just comparing the two. We also try to give points and tips uh, throughout the season to give you guys a chance to save your own seeds. One that we were kind of surprised by is healthy eating has actually been in our surveys as something that people who are participating in our program find that by uh, doing the citizen seed trial, they tend to do more other gardening too. Um, it's a chance to enhance your garden skills. And one of the best ones is you got to be part of a community. We have our CST a uh, Facebook group that's um, been super active and was really active this year and last year. And it's a great place to just ask gardening questions and talk about different people's trials and all that sort of thing. And yeah, so I guess I'll start off just um, why do variety trials? Uh, one of them is to, I, the biggest one is to identify the optimal plant variety for your region. So Oh, while well, we do a smaller trial, just usually a couple of crops and citizen seed trials, farmers will do trials with 12, well, eight or 12 varieties and see what works best on their farm one year and decide to plant a whole bunch of that next year once they know it works well. And in that sense, since they've already tested it through a variety trial, it's effectively mitigating the risk associated with farming. It also allows people to source and find new interesting varieties that they maybe haven't heard of. Uh, as part of our Kenobi project, that's the Canadian Organic Vegetable Improvement Project. We've worked a lot for Dikio and Rutabaga in the past few years, which is a bit of a rare variety, uh, like not so known um, food crops here. And uh, it's also great to replace the drop variety. Uh, sometimes you'll buy seeds from the same company for a long time, and then all of a sudden that seed's no longer available. So it's a great way to find uh, a next seed. And it can be a great part of research. That's the big focus of our citizen seed trial is to collect data and um, do some research. It's great for our carrot trial this year. That's been a long-term breeding project and uh, to try to create our own supply of open pollinated organic carrot seeds out on the West Coast. And I've already mentioned, but again, to be part of a community of growers, uh, it's a great way for farmers and gardeners to network with each other. Um, so I'll just quickly go over basic types of cultivars because I talk about them a bit in the presentation. Um, but when we hear heirloom, it just refers to an open pollinated variety, which means the pollen between different plants is unobstructed, unobstructed and it can flow in between each other. And it's usually just referring to a plant cultivar that's a bit older. So yeah, an open pollinated kind of explain that. And then hybrid, um, they really do control the pollen um, where it moves. So there's specific male plants and, um, that give the pollen and specific receiving pollen plants. And it's um, made by first taking two parents and selfing them a whole bunch till they're completely uh, homozygous or what we call all their genes um, at each allele are the same. So then when you cross them, you get a really vigorous plant because they are um, extremely heterozygous and um, 
have the best genes from both parents. So often hybrid production takes a lot of testing to see what two parent plants uh, get the result that they're looking for. But the thing with hybrids is uh, you wanna avoid saving seeds from them because the resulting plants won't be true to type because once you've saved seed from that first generation, you start to see the inbred characteristics of the parents start to come back in the second generation. So in our trials this year, we've got two hybrids. We've got our sun gold tomatoes, which are a hybrid variety, as well as the bolero carrots, which we haven't sent out yet, uh, but they're also a hybrid, popular hybrid carrot. So we're going to talk a lot about tomatoes because I know that's been the biggest uh, problem we've had this year is some of our tomato germination, but we're going to talk about that and kind of open the floor on how that's going. So uh, we have our first up is our sun gold tomato. It's a really popular hybrid golden orange tomato. It's known to be really sweet with vibrant firm tomatoes that grow on long trusses. Uh, we got these seeds from West Coast Seeds and it's a really popular variety. A lot of farmers grow sun golds because it's pretty dependable. Then soleils are very similar to sun golds, but they're an open pollinated variety. Uh, they've got great small orange cherry tomatoes as well. We've grown them at our research and education seed farm for quite a few years now. And uh, then this year we've are also are testing the strawberry cherry variety from Met Chosen Farms. So they're more of a pink red, great tasting cherry tomato. I haven't grown them before, so looking forward to seeing how they do in this trial. And uh, yeah. So moving on, so just preliminary results from our seed linked is we can obviously the sun gold tomato is doing the best for germination and then strawberry cherry and then finally soleil. So tomato germination um, for the sun gold has also obviously been faster and at higher rates than the soleil and strawberry and we've kind of figured it's probably one of four reasons is one, either the seed saving techniques, two, the environmental conditions, three, there might be some kind of seed dormancy, which we'll talk a bit about, and four, it might be hybrid bigger. As I was talking about the hybrids, it tends to be uh, the first generation is really vigorous, and since sun golds are hybrid, they've got really optimized plant parents that have been uh, heavily selected to um, perform really well for the offspring to perform really well. So to tomato seed saving techniques, some possible errors might have been um, seeds may have been over fermented in some cases. So generally when we save tomato seeds to get rid of the little pulp, we'll uh, put them in water and for like a few days, general room rule of thumb is one to seven days, but it's temperature dependent. And if you can see in this pictures, especially on the left, you can see that a lot of the seeds have gone right to the bottom. And on the top, there's a few seeds that are floating. So we would basically decant that mixture, get rid of everything on the top and uh, decanting also the tomato bits are lighter than the seeds. So you can also get rid of all the flesh and things. Um, but yeah, the hybrid vigor gets rid of that, the, not the hybrid vigor, the fermentation gets rid of that little gel sac. Um, another thing that might've happened, uh, we think this, we're not so sure that this is uh, our problem because at our seed farm, we had different, um, lots of seeds. I had saved some. Um, my manager, David, who's on the call, had saved some and we combined all of them. Uh, it's also possible, number two, is that seeds sunk to the bottom, but we're still on the lightweight side. Cherry tomatoes do have smaller seeds than regular tomato seeds, but a solution to this would just to be running the seeds through a, a winnower, which separates seeds, seeds by, uh, by weight. So the lighter seeds would move farther away than the heavier seeds, and uh, you could just get rid of those really lightweight seeds. Um, and our third is possibly that the seeds may have been picked before the plant was at complete maturity. Uh, typically with the tomato seeds, some of them I made sauce with and also saved the seeds from. So for that, you're still picking the tomato when it's uh, not overripe, you're picking it at just kind of ripeness. But really, ideally, the best way to save tomatoes is, uh, and most seeds, is to let them stay on the plant as long as possible so they can get as many nutrients from the plant as they can uh, before harvesting from the plant. And we, I'll talk this bit, bit more later. Yeah, so this, uh, we did a little germination test just on our seeds in the past few years. And on um, the far right, we have our Soleil tomatoes from 2019, which have had really good germination. It looks like all of the seeds we tested on the paper 
seem to germinate fine. And on the far left, we have this year's seeds, which were mailed to everybody, which have terrible germination. Um, I don't mean, I think there's maybe one that's germinated in that picture. But what is kind of funny is the middle ones, which are our, what we have called the dirty Soleil tomatoes. And these seeds look really dirty. They're like gray, brown in texture because basically uh, the dirty seeds were the ones at the very end of the season that had fallen on the ground. I just picked the seeds up on the, to uh, on the, the tomatoes that had fallen on the ground, picked them up. I didn't pay any attention to them, just stuck them in a bucket, um, fermented them for a while, and then uh, decanted it and cleaned the seeds a bit. They were still dirty, like they obviously had dirt mixed in with the mixture. But what's really funny is these were the last harvested. So I harvested these in, uh, I think, late October, and they actually have incredible germination. And these are seeds from the same year, like both were seeds from 2021. And yet the ones that we harvested very late October that have fallen on the ground and visibly look dirty have done way better than the ones that were picked throughout the earlier in the season. So I think one of the big things that have probably affected the uh, tomato seeds is um, environmental factors. Uh, our heat wave from late June to mid July in 2021, all across Western hemisphere, you guys probably remember it, it was a hot time if you didn't have air conditioning. We had temperatures of 30 degrees plus alongside with drought. Um, at this time, our seed team, we wrote an article, heat, drought and seed production. And we mentioned that seed quality, quantity and quality this year will likely be negatively affected. And we've heard from a lot of different growers that across BC that their tomato seed germination and other seeds have had uh, quite low germination this year. And yeah, the heat and drought, if you guys are part of the trial last year, you might have had your snow peas die. This picture I think was taken early July. And as you can see, the snow peas just could not handle the high heats of last year. And most people in the trials had their plants uh, die or really fall back. Um, it made it for really early pea harvest season. We got lots of seeds from these, uh, but yeah, they definitely did not make it through to July for a lot of our participants. And this makes sense. Snow peas are a cold season crop and they do not thrive in high temperatures. So here's just a couple of pictures of our Soleil tomatoes in 2021. Uh, we grew them um, uh, obviously, they're indeterminate varieties. All the tomatoes this year are indeterminate, meaning they'll keep on growing. They don't read a, reach a height and stop growing. So what we did is we connected a string to the sides of our greenhouse, and we just uh, wrapped the tomatoes around the string and got rid of some suckers. We left some. You can see some of the suckers in this picture, but usually getting rid of the suckers is a good practice on to, um, indeterminate tomatoes so they don't get too out of hand. But as you can see, we also grew these in the greenhouse. So the temperature effect on uh, the tomatoes would have been even greater uh, during the heat wave. So the big problem with heat is it affects pollination. Uh, while heat and drought stress can affect crops during all growth phases, damage during the reproduction and seed filling stages can be particularly destructive. Uh, pollinators like bees have disruption in their biology, causing development issues at these temperatures, and they have decreased survival rates. So on one hand, you have your actual pollinators are having a hard time during these seasons. And on the other hand, you have actually that these high temperatures degrade the pollen at a really high rate. And uh, there was a study by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and they found that in tomatoes, temperatures greater than 35 degrees caused a huge reduce, reduction in fruit set. And in peppers, they found temperatures in grady, greater than 32 degrees causes complete pollen sterility. So the pollen is no longer viable at all, which can cause flower drop. And basically at those high temperatures, if you're, first of all, your bees are not moving as fast, your other pollinators aren't, are not, are suffering during these high um, um, temperatures and even the pollen that they pick up, if it's out in that high temperature long enough, it's going to degrade really quickly. Um, and that's even in peppers, which is a hot season crop from hot countries, but even the peppers at those high temperatures um, lose their viability. 
And we see the same thing with a lot of other crops, like in wheat production, temperatures over 35 degrees leads to complete sterility as well. And even temperatures outside of 12 to 20 degrees can cause 20% decline in yields, which is pretty crazy that just the temperature really does play a big part in farming. So yeah, in this picture, uh, this was picture was taken early June. We were looking at the forecast and we saw that, you know, drought and sun was on the forecast for a long time. So we had a mad dash to get up all of our drip irrigation before the high heats came in. And water is really essential for seed formation and just plant plant uh, growth and everything because water is essential for cell expansion. Uh, during seed filling, the water moves along with seeds. So if you have any nutrients in your soil to get through the plant, they move with the water up the plant. So without water uptake, you're having nothing move through the plant. And lack of water can decrease the time of seed filling. So the plant might decide, oh, that's good enough. We got a few seeds, that's all we need. And so that can result in smaller seeds and seeds without as many uh, nutrients within them. And then smaller seeds contain fewer nutrients, so then they have less likely to survive the next year, which causing a low germination. Uh, next, I'm just gonna be talking about uh, seed dormancy. So in nature, seed dormancy is super important because you don't want your plants popping up in December or January. So a lot of our plants from our coast uh, have have dormancy ingrained in them that they have to go through a cold period before they sprout, which is great evolutionary because then you don't have your seeds popping up in December. Things like tomatoes and peppers wouldn't have those traits because they're from warmer countries. Um, and we, we also see in nature is delayed germination. Well, things will pop up at different intervals at different times. And this is just because if everything popped up in February and then you got a frost in May, March, you wouldn't want your seeds coming up. So uh, oftentimes in nature, the plants, when we harvest them from the wild to be uh, cultivatable, we have to slowly get them so they germinate in more similar windows so they're better for farming. Uh, so there's a couple different types of seed dormancy. We either call it exogenous, so external dormancy, or endogenous dormancy, so internal. And uh, the exogenous dormancy is usually physical, so oftentimes it's the seed coat is really thick and impermeable, so sometimes people will scratch their seed on sandpaper or just kind of clip off a little bit. That can be useful for seeds of really thick coats, kind of like nasturtium um, and lupins, things like that could, can sometimes use that help. And, uh, but that wouldn't be found in tomatoes. And then there's also chemicals. So it's something on the outside of the seed that needs to be leached out before the plant can grow. Uh, more than the endogenous, um, endogenous dormancy is more of a chemical cue inside of the seed itself that prevents germination. So chemicals changes can occur within the seed, um, could be the seeds didn't develop properly or it could be caused by environmental cues. So that kind of gets us into our primary dormancy or secondary dormancy. So primary dormancy is when the seed, when you harvest it is, is dormant and it's generally broken by cues. Like I talked about like cold or heat treatment. Um, some people say carrots need some light. Um, I've seen carrots grow without it or everything needs water. And then secondary dormancy, it's more related to after the fact and it's really not well studied. So it's like you've harvested the crops and sometime between when you've harvested it <coughs> and when you plant it, something has happened to the seeds, maybe in storage or something that has caused a secondary dormancy. But yeah, I, I looked it up. There wasn't really a ton of studies on what would cause this, but it's definitely caused by a buildup of ABA, which is short for abscisic acid. And then here's some examples of seed dormancy that we've seen on our farm. So on the left is a chart from 2020, our seed farm germination table that year. And I'll just point out a couple of them, um, like Celtus was 4% and we had a couple of, or both of our lettuces, the Gold Russian Revolution, one at 1%, which is awful germination, and the other at 39, and even our Facilia at 47%. We took these same seeds and we tested a few of the low germination in, 20, in 2020 and tested them again in 2022. 
And Lucille Tooth, for example, it went up from 4% to 72%. And the Revolution Lettuce from 39 to 80. And the Facilia from 47 to 92%. So we can see huge increases. Sometimes seeds just need to sit a year before they're ready to germinate. So we think likely the problem with the tomato seeds um, that we've been seeing in both our Soleil trial, our strawberry cherry and um, other tomatoes that have been grown in BC is likely some kind of um, endogenous um, seed dormancy that has been caused by high temperatures. And the reason we kind of think this is abscisic acid for the seed to germinate, it needs to be completely leached out of the seed before it'll germinate. If there's any abscisic acid, it blocks germination. And in the citizen seed trial group, we've seen some people have their Soleil tomatoes are popping up two months later. So that might mean that the seeds are taking two months to leach out that abscisic acid. So the people that have been constantly watering those plants, basically watering, they're just leaching out this acid through each watering um, to, to eventually allow the plant to germinate. So we think this is likely, while we can't you know, ask the seeds, hey, what's wrong with you? Um, I'd like to think that this is a likely reason is there's been some kind of buildup of abscisic acid in the seed. And um, some notable facts that I just thought were kind of interesting when I was looking into this is, yeah, that our 2020 seeds germinated way better compared to our 2021 batch. So that kind of indicates to me that there's some kind of possible dormancy happening in our 2021 batch of seeds. And second, that the dirty tomato seeds, seeds that had um, fallen from the tomato off the vine had a much better germination rate than the same tomatoes. So there's kind of a few things that come out of that, like possibly maybe we're harvesting the fruits too early. Maybe the seeds hadn't gotten quite enough nutrients from the plant. Uh, and it's possible that it's just they did better because they were harvested way later in the season. Those tomatoes weren't pollinating during the heat dome, because if we harvest them last of October, they were probably um, flowering in August when it wasn't so hot. And yeah, and it's possible that it's just random, but I think that from the picture that we see here, it's pretty clear that the dirty seeds are doing way better than the, um, the same seed lot um, from earlier that season. So to me, that really shows that there was something earlier on the season that has caused these seeds to not um, develop as well. Okay, so um, now I'm just gonna quickly go over evaluation of variety trials and we'll just kind of look through some points to look out for uh, during the season. So yeah, beginning of the season, right now you should probably just be looking, most people are probably just rating their germination. Vigor is also something that can be uh, looked at and rated pretty early in the season. Vigor is usually when the plant is small but growing uh, well, like they're kind of at a decent height and you're just kind of comparing how that early vigor is compared to other like how uh how fast is the plant growing is the plant flowering early is it does it look healthy those kind of things and then things uh late season would be kind of like earliness you're going to rate that once you get your first tomatoes um yield flavor height and then throughout the season things like to watch out for is the insect pressure disease pressure and vigor can also be throughout the season. Um, yeah, so, and also just make sure to be consistent with your evaluation between different trials, uh, between the different varieties. So you might wanna make sure it's the same person going out to evaluate them, uh, that kind of thing. So here's just the rubric we've created for the cherry tomato trial. Um, it's a great little handy rubric if you guys ever want something to look at. Um, I think for me this year, the biggest things is I'd love to see the earliness, uh, the differences between the different tomato varieties to see which ones are actually early and which ones are yielding well. And another big one is appearance. We're really curious on the cracking. We obviously, nobody likes it when their tomato cracks. So we'd really like to know how like the Soleil and the strawberry cherry uh, compare to the sun gold when it comes to uh, cracking throughout the season. So next, we'll just talk a bit about our bush beans. So we have two varieties, Easy Pick and Straight and Narrow. They're both from our Farm Folk, City Folk Research and Education Seed Farm uh, last year. And these beans, um, I think the biggest thing I would 
I think I'm encouraging people to just kind of, the beans look similar if you look at them from afar, but if you actually go up close and look how the pods are forming, they actually look quite different. So I would encourage everybody just to kind of look at them and see how they're um, growing differently and what kind of yield is different. I know Easy Pick has kind of been created to have, to, well, first of all, in the name, easy to pick, but also they're supposed to have a, quite a short window of time that they have beans. So it'd be really interesting to see if the Easy Pick actually does have quite a narrow harvest window compared to the straight and narrow, which hasn't really been bred for that, but it'd be interesting to see how they compare in the, that way. And yeah, so here's the same chart. Um, definitely, uh, I find with um, beans, especially if you're saving from, for seed, it's great to just space them out a bit more because uh, they can get, especially in the fall season when you're waiting for them to dry up to save your seeds, they can take a long time to dry out if they're way too close to each other. There's just a lack of airflow and you have a high chance of your seeds rotting. Uh, yeah. Um, and also lodging resistance, that's kind of talking about whether your plant is up straight or if it's falling down. That's something we'd love to compare between the two, um, easy pick and straight and narrow, just to see how uh, steady those crops, those plants are. So the carrots, they're still growing at the UBC greenhouse, but we'll ma mail them out in late May or early June. Once we, once we get them, we will send them, I promise. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a bit about our selection process because I think the carrot trial, it's quite interesting. This pruning project has been going on for about five years. It started when there was noted, when we, um, BC Seeds at the time, noticed that many organic carrot producers were getting their seeds from Lima Grain, which is an international company based out of France. And that's where the majority of organic carrot seeds were coming from. And most, and all of them, a lot of a popular variety is Bolero, which we're comparing our breeding project to. And as soon as you're dependent on those international chains, as we saw in COVID, things can happen and you can get cut off from your supply. So it was kind of identified that we needed an open pollinated organic carrot supply in BC that would be able to be just as competitive, just as good as these hybrid varieties. So the picture on the left is one that we took at Force Bar Farm. So we grew out carrots at a bunch of different farms, like our research and education farm, Force Bar Farm, UBC Farms, and they're all part of a trial. And the picture on the right is uh, the carrots. You can see the yellow stakes. They kind of separate the families, which I'll talk a bit about in these next slides. So uh, yeah, the carrots, as I said, this selection has been going on for five years, but I'll just talk about this last year. So last year, when the carrots were in flowered, each carrot had their seeds harvested separately. And then on each farm, we had the carrot seeds from one plant. We grew about five, 10 feet of each of, of seeds from each of the plants and then separated them with yellow stakes. So we'd have one carrot. These are all the seeds from this one carrot planted in five feet. Here's all the seeds from the other carrot planted in five feet. And then at the end of the season, this January, we spread out all of our carrots. You saw in that last picture, there was just a ton of carrots, had them separated from each plant. And then we went through and examined all of these. So if we were looking at uh, all the carrots from one plant and we noticed that there was a lot of off types, like if we saw yellow or anything like that, we would just get rid of the whole family if there was enough off types. And then for the remaining groups, whatever families we had, or whoever, you know, the plant parent, whoever we decided the seeds were fried from, we would kind of, we would taste each one to make sure it passed our taste test. And then we, again, got rid of a few families that just didn't taste well, wasn't meeting our criteria. And then from the remaining group, whatever's left over, we just picked the very best carrots from each family. We mixed them all together, planted them out in the greenhouse, and are now have let them go to flower and they'll all flower together. So all those plants will cross pollinate. And then the seeds this year will be harvested similarly where each plant will be harvested separately and um, then sent out. So here's a picture of uh, the carrots growing in the greenhouse. So on the left, you can kind of see how we prepared them for planting. We gave the tops a little haircut so they weren't losing a lot of 
water through transpiration through their leaves. And then even though these carrots were cut in the bottom to have a taste test, they're still fine to plant even though it wasn't the whole carrot. Sometimes cutting the carrot, it can increase your chance of um, rot and things like that, but it's also, they still will grow roots on the sides of the carrot. So it's fine to chop off and have a little taste. And then uh, the bottom right picture, you can see that's after that some that have been planted for a couple of weeks and they've already started to grow their own little tops. So um, yeah, the carrot trial, the biggest things we're looking out for is number one, blunt tips. So you can see on this picture of the right, kind of what we mean, all these carrots at the bottom are kind of thick at the bottom and then they kind of go into nothing. We're not looking for the typical, you know, Looney Tunes carrot that's a triangle. We're kind of looking for more of a rectangle shaped carrot. And then we're looking for orange color. We want really, really orange carrots. And we also, when you cut your carrot open, we were also looking on the inside. You know how the carrot has that little core on the inside? We also wanted that core to be orange and not yellowish. Another thing we were looking for is uniformity. So I think this picture is a great picture because you can see all the carrots are around the same size. So they were all pretty uniform. So this family was really nice. Number 12 liked it. And we we're also looking for carrots um, without big hairs coming out. Nobody likes to eat a carrot that's all hairy. They like um, not a ton of side roots. So we're also looking for carrots that didn't have a ton of side roots. And finally, we're looking for big roots. We like to eat big carrots. So here's just some examples of the other families that we probably didn't pick. So this number 37 on the right, as you can see, there is tons of yellow from that carrot. And yellow is actually a dominant gene in carrots. Though we think that there's other pathways. There's definitely, um, I, some people know a lot about carrot breeding, but while typically we think of yellow as a dominant trait, there are some other effects I'm sure um, that can cause carrot yellowness. But just in case, if we saw a yellow carrot, we got rid of the whole family because we know that gene might be hard to get rid of later on. But you guys in your trial, you might come across an orange carrot. It, I mean, a yellow carrot, it could happen. And in that case, we want you to rate the appearance low because we're not looking for yellow. And then on the top left, um, this is another family we weren't so crazy about just because it didn't have the blunt tips. As you can see, the carrots are quite triangular and there's little roots at the end. And we were looking really for like the bottom left, that really deep orange color with nice blunt tips. So yeah, when you're rating your appearance, and these are kind of the big three things to look for is first orange color, blunt tips, and lack of root hairs. So I'm just, I think a lot of you have probably um, been in citizen seed trial and are pretty used to the seed linked uh, platform, but I'm just gonna go over a bit of it. And if you have any questions, we're gonna open up the floor at the end just to um, answer any questions, but you can kind of see um, the biggest thing is we use a one to five scale for most traits. Um, don't fret about it too much, uh, just, Whatever you think, if it's a four, if it's a five, um, give it to you, uh, give it that rating. I think something that people tend to do is they avoid the extremes. So people are really hesitant to use a one or to use a five, but um, it's great to use those extremes. If you think you have an, a five tomato, rate it number five. Um, just don't be scared of the extremes. And another big thing is we'd love to figure out the maturity and the, the when it the earliness, what time it matures, and the harvest window. So we have, um, you can see on the top left, you can enter your planting date, your transplanting date, if it's applicable, and your first and harvest, last harvest date. These are really useful for us um, to figure out our planting windows. Because some of these crops, like the strawberry cherry, um, it's gonna, hopefully it's gonna be sold on a wider scale. Right now it's just at Mitchosen Farms, but it'd be great for them to know that kind of data to scale up their farm business. And that's another thing is uh, the, the citizen seed trials really deal with quite small seed farmers. Um, so really, I think you're really helping out these small scale farmers um, build up their business by participating in these trials and sometimes, or just pr like the carrots, you're really helping progress a uh, breeding breeding project. So you can also add quantitative measures. So that could be things like pictures, um, germination percentages. Some people have entered their height and yield. 
you don't have to weigh your crops, you don't have to measure them or anything like that. But if you do, it's great to just leave it in one of the comments um, uh, as, or sometimes it's also called a rating reason after you give the, the stars, it'll give a, ask a question about the reason. And also things like poor yield or disease res resistant, those can be great adjectives to use um, when rating your crops. And we love to see the pictures too. Um, another fun thing you can do if your trial is do a tasting trial. So you can invite over some friends and just um, try out uh, the different crops. And with that, I'm going to just open up the floor. So um, feel free to unmute yourself. Let us know how your trial's going. If you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. Um, if you have any tips to share, things that you found useful, um, yeah, I'll just take a look at the chat and feel free to ask any questions. While you're all thinking of your questions, um, maybe I'll just mention about the comment I put in the chat. Um, <clears throat> I just did talk to the researcher up at UBC this past week, and she was just uh, letting me know that things have been growing slowly, like we've heard from most farmers and uh, probably gardeners around the province. Um, so the the carrots, just because they have, we haven't had any a lot of sunny weather. The the seeds are ripening, but she said she wishes they were ripening faster. Um, so hopefully by early June, but it might be a little bit later. <clears throat> okay, which of the two have darker leaves and are shorter in stature, strawberry or the other? Oh, it's sun gold. Um, Hmm, darker leaves and shorter in stature. I haven't grown the strawberry cherries, but do you have an idea, David? They, all of them look pretty similar to me. So it looks like Karen is saying that strawberry cherries are stockier. Um, it sounds like, uh, it sounds like maybe you, you labeled one of the three varieties and you're trying to figure out what the other two are. I'd say one of the other hints is if one of the ones you're, trying to figure out what it was has really high germination it's probably the sun gold um yeah oh and they just commented and they can wait to see if the fruit is orange or red <laughs> that would also give you a pretty good yeah yeah good determination of which one it is uh, i have a question um i planted my bush beans in a soil that may not be the right soil it's more clay. Have you had any experience with the type of uh, soil that's good for bush beans? Yeah, I think with clay soil, especially since we've had a really wet spring, um, it is possible uh, that the seeds could be like rotting before they're germinating. Um, I, I don't think, I think clay soil can be totally fine to plant beans in. It's just kind of the weather. If it's really wet, it can be a bit challenging. Um, I mean, loam is always the best, but do you have any comments, David, beyond that? Um, I, <clears throat> I think I would just caution planting too early with those beans. Like if you put it in a wet soil at this time of year, given this season, it's probably not going to do so well. So either way, just wait till it's, it warms up a bit. Um, so there's a, a question here, uh, somebody from Marie Eve, um, her soleils did not germinate and strawberry cherry had two successful germinations. So very uh, standard, probably based on like a, probably very similar to everybody else, uh, what, it, what the rest of us are seeing. Um, does she go ahead and rate, uh, record information on sun gold? I, I would actually record information on all of them right now. You can record germination rate on all three. Um, obviously sun gold will be your five and the other two will be, uh, um, you know, the soleil are gonna be a one and you can decide on the cherry.
you can also go back if you if you keep watering them say and suddenly a whole lot of strawberry cherry pop up and you had already rated it you can go back in and re-rate the germination and it will average your numbers so if you're you know your initial germination rate was two soleil or two two strawberry cherry but next week four more pop up you can go in and re-rate germination and add four in Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hope everybody's finding Seedlink easy to use. Um, they also have an app. If you didn't know, I actually love the app for um, on the farm and just on the go. Um, it's not always the easiest to bring your computer outside and rate them, uh, but they have a good app too. Um, and we also this year we have um, printable data sheets that I've been sending out in some of the emails, but I'll be sure to send them out in every one. That's especially great if you have like a classroom or a bunch of people that are rating it. Um, you could just print out the papers, um, the um, appropriate pages, and just hand them out and get your class or group to rate individually and then go into Seedlink and do a bunch of individual ratings and it'll average it out for you. Okay, yeah, somebody's suggesting um, that since the soil warms up really late there, they started their beans indoors and paper pots to plant out later. And I think definitely that might be a good way to go this year is starting your beans inside, but also you can wait till just a bit later once your soil is a bit drier to direct seed. But yeah, I think it's, they're good to transplant or to direct sow. Um, there's a, a question there. You've got five sun golds, two strawberry cherry, one soleil, and you're going to plant one of each out. Um, can you give the rest away? Yeah, for sure. Don't don't worry about it. If that's the room you have in your garden, um, that's fine. You can give the rest of the plants away to friends. It's nice to have, uh, you know, one of each to to test and to look at. Um, and you'll have already rated the germination. So. Um, Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, it's also great. I've seen in the citizen C trial before people will post that their plants, none of them came up, but somebody nearby them sometimes has one too. So also a great way to use the Facebook group and I don't know, see if somebody else, if you don't have friends nearby that are gardeners, um, there might be somebody in the group that's nearby that would love them if theirs haven't done so well. And, and just to, to, yeah, and Fiona, you don't, you don't have to go to your neighbor's place and, uh, rate the plants in their yard. You can just, just do the ones, the three that you plant in your own. I'm curious to know if there's anybody on this call that's uh, doing the seed trial with a class or as part of a school or a group. Feel free to just plop yes in the chat if that's the case. And uh, it's, it's something we're hoping to do a bit more in the future. So I'm curious if there's anybody here. Yeah, generally it is recommended to plant um, more tomatoes, but honestly, we, we realize a lot of people are sometimes growing on balconies and things like that. And there's enough of us that um, a few people having smaller populations is totally fine for the data when we're having at least usually 80 plus people. Um, even if there's a few um, that are maybe a bit off type, because sometimes when you just have one plant, it might be a bit of an off type. It usually won't alter the collective data before. Like we've been part of larger farm trials and we've had one variety just got completely eaten by slugs or something, but it's usually fine because somebody else has those plants too, which is also a big benefit of us being a lot of us because it can really get um, great data and also kind of safeguard from those kind of the outliers when somebody writes something a one because all their tomatoes cracked, but it was just because they had a bad seed and they were just unlucky with the genetics. Um, but also if you are trying, if your goal to, is to save seeds from these um, crops, you'll generally wanna look at something like Seed Savers Exchange um, 
seed saving chart, which kind of gives you general minimum population size um, uh, suggestions. So like for tomatoes, I know for saving seed, they usually recommend you grow six plants just so you don't um, narrow the genetics too much when you're saving seeds from just one plant. You might have missed uh, some good genetics from the population. So yeah, it also kind of depends. If you're just doing it for a trial and to eat, um, less plants is fine. But yeah, if your goal is seed saving, you're usually looking at a bit uh, bigger uh, population. That's a, a great question. Um, if Sun Gold is already being sold by West Coast Seeds, a large seed source, why is it in the trial? Um, <clears throat> it's there because we're growing two other uh, cherry tomatoes, not red cherry tomatoes. One's, one is orange like Sun Gold and one's the other. So um, Sun Gold we know to be sort of like an industry uh, workhorse. <clears throat> the, People who grow lots of tomatoes, they often grow sun golds because they produce so well and so everybody knows them to be a really good tomato. So we always try to compare whatever other varieties we're working on to, uh, you know, the, the highest standard we can find out there. Um, sun golds. Sun Gold is sold by a big company. It's produced, you know, internationally. It's... Um, it's probably got a patent that was owned by Monsanto is now owned by Bayer. So it's not the seed we choose to grow on our garden for various reasons, but not necessarily because it doesn't grow really well. Um, so what we're looking to do is try to find a similar type variety in an open pollinated seed source, hopefully from somebody that grows them locally. Yeah, sometimes we also call it a Czech variety. So even if you are growing, um, if you have another tomato that's not part of the trial, but it's something that you've grown for a long time, I'm pretty sure you can even add that variety mm -hmm. to seed linked and use it as a check because you know what to expect from that variety. So in a way, even though many people haven't grown sun gold before, we can consider it like a check variety. Oh yeah, I see you just said, so sun gold is the control and the other two of the experiments. That, that's the perfect way to put it. That's pretty much what it is. Um, if we have room, do you want us to grow both in and out of the greenhouse slash cover? Ideally, yes. Um, whatever, it's, whatever condition you have for your plant, try to have the exact same condition for all your trials. So if you're growing your one tomato in a greenhouse, it'd be great to grow all three in the, tomato, in the greenhouse. If you're growing them outside, it'd be great if they all have similar amount of sun levels. Like you don't plant one underneath your tree and the other two in your nice southern facing garden, you know, um, as much as you can try to eliminate those environmental factors. And that goes for all the trials. And, and if you're having, yeah, so if you say you've got both options, do you want to replicate it? You can replicate the trial. You can do one inside and one outside. And uh, it would be interesting. Maybe we'll find that actually sun gold don't do as well inside as out, than outside compared to the other two. Um, but we're not asking everybody to do that. So if you have the space um, and you think that would be an interesting thing to find out, or there's something you could find out from uh, replicating the trial like that, then for sure, by all means, do it. Yeah. When, when we do trials in farmer fields often, or especially at research sites, we will replicate the same trial in the same field. So we'll actually sometimes split the field into three and grow the same uh, three or whatever varieties we're trialing in th the three different spots. And we'll also randomize where they are in those spots. So um, the, the more sort of repetition in the trialing, the better the data is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, blight resistance, that'll be an interesting one. I know at our farm last year, it was like we had a few varieties early September, they were just gone, um, just blight hit and they were all gone and some other varieties seemed to survive till late October. And the ones in the greenhouse, especially since they didn't have the rain falling down on them, which the rain usually is what's um, carrying like blight and diseases quite often. The ones in the greenhouse, I don't even think got blight at all till the end of, till like, I don't, I don't think they ever got blight. So it's, um, blight can be, yeah, especially um, um, not as bad in greenhouses, but then you can get other diseases in greenhouse, like 
last year for the first time we had some spider mites which was surprising on our eggplants um so you know because it's drier things like spider mites like dry uh so you can kind of get different afflictions depending on depending on where you are um, and then I see, is it beneficial to try and shade the plants if we have extreme heat again this season or let the plants react to it, maybe adapt and record data? I think it's, um, I think you can do either. I think it's great to see how the plants do in the environment you would normally plant them in. Like normally you would plant tomatoes in your sunniest garden. And I think um, like last year, it was interesting to see uh, whose snow pea plants died really early and in what areas they seem to do better. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Do you have any comments on that, David? Um, yeah, I, th I think uh, I think if you have a, if we have a season like last season, your your plants will probably do better if you can shade them a little bit and or reduce the heat. You know, if it's extreme like that, tomatoes do like heat, um, but that was a bit too much. And again, like as Siri mentioned, uh, don't shade one of the varieties and not the other two, but maybe that's obvious, but just if you're gonna shade them, shade all of them so that they're, they have the same, uh, you're doing the same thing to all of them. <laughs> Great, yeah, it seems like, um... Have anybody planted their tomatoes outside yet? Just curious. I have. Oh, okay. Yeah, we still haven't gotten them at the farm, but our farm's really wet because we have really um, wet soil. So it's hard to plant early in the season. Um, as far as I know, the strawberry cherry is not a dwarf. It's just, a, and it's not a determinate. It is an indeterminate tomato. Um, I did actually grow some of them last year uh, outside in my garden, and they grew quite similar in structure to sun golds, I thought. Oh, wow. See, yeah, Karen found their slow cans did great last year um, in, in Prince, Prince George. George. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, that's a bit farther north. I wonder, hmm, interesting. Yeah, because our all of our snow peas um, died off in July. Sometimes it's a location, and I, I I think from what I remember from some of the comments, it was the people who had them planted in like shadier places that maybe they weren't doing so well earlier on, but they ended up doing better once the heat hit. Um, yeah, it seemed to be though that the slow can snow peas um, fared better in those extreme <clears throat> weathers compared to the Beauregard, and I think that is maybe um, do because they are more locally adapted. They're from the Slocan Valley, um, whereas Beauregard, those seeds were from, I think the states from high mowing, right? I think, um, or they were from some American company, so not quite as adapted for our area. Um, and I don't know if there's still people on the call that mentioned they are doing the trial with a group or with a, a school group or with another group, but um, if there's any way we can help support that, um, feel free to just email us directly and reach out. Yeah, we're really hoping to increase our capacity. We're launching this year, we have a pilot seed stewardship program across six schools across BC. So we've been meeting up with six different classrooms and uh, letting the kids choose a crop to try to grow up for seed. And then either the same, whatever teacher, the new students, some oftentimes uh, in my school, one of them's like a split class. So luckily a lot of the kids will probably be in the same class next year and be able to harvest the same seeds. But um, it's also kind of nice to show, like you start the seeds, but then, you know, the next generations of kids get to harvest it. Okay, I see somebody be interested in bringing that to our school. Yeah, this year we've been working on PowerPoint slides and getting a whole bunch of resources together. We're just kind of, the kids this year are guinea pigs, but we're hoping to be, uh, to share all of those um, slides and activities um, definitely in the next year uh, once we've kind of fine tuned them. Yeah, and hopefully if you're in one of our areas, yeah. 
um, somebody might be able to come out because right now we have um, coordinators in Metro Vancouver, Lower Van Vancouver Island and um, the interior, but um, more Pemberton area. Okay, well, we're coming up to six, so I'll leave the call open for a couple more minutes, um, but then we'll leave. Um, I see somebody asked if we should trim suckers. Um, I think you can or you cannot. It kind of depends on what you want to do. Uh, since they're indeterminate, I find at the farm they can get really out of hand if I don't trim the suckers. They just grow a bit too big and things are a bit if you have a cage, sometimes it's a bit easier, but if you're just attaching them to one stake or like as we do one string, um, it can be really hard to um, keep your plants standing up. Um, but if you have a cage, it's usually a bit easier to not trim the suckers, but um, yeah, it's kind of your choice. Yeah, but yeah, especially indeterminate varieties. I, I like to pick the suckers just so they don't um, fall on over, fall all over the place. And because then you get um, like kind of instead of the plant just keep on growing and producing flowers and flowers way too late in the season and the flowers won't even get to fruit because it's too late. If you kind of concentrate the plants just so um, the main stem is producing flowers and um, just the main off stems, you tend, you often will get more fruit just because you don't get, especially later in the season, you don't need flowers in late August because they're probably not going to fruit set anyways. So it can kind of be of a way to get more energy to developing your fruits and less to getting those late season flowers. Okay, well, with that, we're um, at the top of the hour. So um, thank you all so much for joining us today. And uh, yeah, we'll have a few more of these meet and greets uh, throughout the season uh, and just keeping everybody updated on what's going on. It's a, uh, it's, uh, I really enjoyed this today. It was a lovely way to spend my evening. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.